it's my privilege to be here, so thank you for having me. Um, I consider it an honor because I know that this is where God's word is the ultimate authority. It's in this pop pulpit where it's taught with accuracy and with clarity so that we would know what he says um, and what he wants from us to live faithfully unto him. And that's simply my desire this morning is just to preach the word. I want to teach the word. So we're going to be in the book of Lamentations. If you guys would flip there with me. If you're not familiar uh, and you open up your Bible just into the middle, you'll probably hit about the book of Psalms. Flip to the right. You should see Isaiah maybe, Jeremiah, and it's just after the book of Jeremiah, you'll hit Lamentations. So it's a smaller book and it's easy to miss. So as you flip there, I, I just want to say first that uh, my goal this morning was to keep, in, th keep in, uh, in tune with the recent theme at One Love, which, which has been uh, talking about feelings. So... Two weeks ago, I think, Pastor Waxer shared a sermon, we watched this, a sermon that talked about feelings. And what he said was that feelings are ultimately meant to lead us back to God. And at Windward, uh, at the Windward campus where I'm from last week, Pastor Darrell Keene actually taught us that it's the grace of God that enables our righteous responses to our emotions. When they can be taken in the spirit of the flesh, it's actually the grace of God that enables us. Now, this morning, what I want to show through the word of God is how the truth and the character of God is our liberation from emotional bondage and strapping. So I'm going to be reading Lamentations chapter 3, verses 16 through 24. I'm going to read it first, and then we'll pray and ask the Lord to bless our time in his word. Verse 16. He has made my teeth grind on gravel and made me cower in ashes. My soul is bereft of peace. I have forgotten what happiness is. So I say, my endurance has perished. So has my hope from the Lord. Remember my affliction and my wanderings, the wormwood and the gall. My soul continually remembers it and is bowed down within me. Verse 21. But this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. Let's pray. Lord, we submit to the authority of your word this morning. Everything that you've said through your word, Lord, our spirit wants to hear. And our spirit wants to do. And so we're asking that you would give us the ability to hear your truths and to re respond to them appropriately, Lord. Give us the awareness to sil silence any portions of our flesh that might otherwise inhibit and hinder us from living faithfully unto you this morning. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Hey, so uh, a few months ago, um, I was at home and I had a text message and a friend, a really close friend of mine, had some, something unbelievably tragic happen to him. Now the details of what happened are not necessary maybe, but um, it was something that impacted his, him that would f impact his future forever. It was, it was incredibly tragic, and I sat there at home weeping, and I was broken, and I was confused, and I was bitter, and I had a little bit of anxiousness, a little bit of shame in me. When I got the most comforting text, actually, and it was from my friend's mom. I, I texted her, actually, to check up on her and make sure she was going and doing okay, and I wanted to pray for her, and, that, and I'm feeling all these things inside of me, and she responds with the most timely text, and it said, Duke, 
God has a plan that we don't yet see. And it was the truth. That was the truth. God has a plan that I couldn't yet see. And the truth, it comforted me and it set me free. Now, I was still sad, very sad, but hopeful, hopeful in it. And the author of Lamentations, in the same way, portions this part of scripture, which include the famous words that we just read, great is thy faithfulness, where we get that beautiful hymn. So we get the beautiful, he pens these words actually in the midst of despair. See, Jerusalem had just been completely destroyed. Babylon came in and sieged them and attacked them and, and, and took people to captivity and killed the rest. And they destroyed the temple and they flattened it. And people were starving and dying. Actually, earlier in the book of Lamentations, uh, Jeremiah, he's, he's lamenting because there's babies dying in their mother's arms of starvation. It, it's the scene that's taking place when Jeremiah pens these things. I want to quote one commentator who said of the viciousness of Babylon's conquest, they often flayed people, gouged their eyes out, impaled them, or decapitated them. Strategy for conquest was not merely physical, but psychological, intentionally destroying that which gave people identity and stability. See, what they were doing was trying to put these horrible, lasting images on, on, on these men. They would abuse their families with them, you know, strapped up. And then they would rip their eyes out. So the last thing they seen was the people who they loved the most being hurt. And then they would leave them off into captivity. This is the type of horrors that Israel is experiencing as Jeremiah is witnessing it all. And so we find our author, the prophet Jeremiah, writing from what some scholars actually believe might be the Mount of Olives. He was either there as a witness and, and witnessing the destruction or lamenting and reflecting upon these things, but we have a picture up here. I'm not sure who that guy is. We don't know him. It's not me, uh, but this is in Jerusalem. And so where he is would be on the Mount of Olives, actually. And he's, I guess, scratching his head or maybe referencing behind him, which would be the city of Jerusalem. And it's not too far away. As you guys can see, it's less than two miles See, the Mount of Olives is only separated by the Kidron Valley, right? It's just a small valley between the two. And so here he stands and he's preaching. And this would probably be the vicinity that Jeremiah is actually in. As he's either writing or reflecting or even witnessing maybe the horrors of what's happening over in Jerusalem. Okay? So for us, as we look at the book of Lamentations as a whole, the first two chapters, they make sense. It make a lot of sense. Those are understandable as they detail the hurt and the bitterness and, and the events and the destruction and despair that's going on right now in Jerusalem. And the 19 verses of the third chapter, those are understandable too because Jeremiah doesn't begin to just survey the outside situation. He begins to reflect on what's going on with him. And he says there's despair and hurt and destruction over what I see in Jerusalem. But these three verses in the middle... These three verses, with, with these words, great is thy faithfulness, they, seem, they just seem out of place. They don't seem like they fit. But what's ironic is that these verses, actually it's four verses, these four verses are the gem of this book. This is the gem. It's the climactic point and it's the hinging point in the book of Lamentations. And to understand Lamentations right and lamenting right in general, we have to understand this. Everything in Lamentations either builds up to this point or finds its resolution from this point. So in studying it, I hope that we find out why and just why it's so essential to Lamentations. Now, before I, um, we jump into the scriptures, I've got to explain something, and that it's, it's the structure of Lamentations, okay? It's actually written as an acrostic. We, we can't see it in our English translation, but if anybody in here reads Hebrew, I know some of you actually do it, it's pretty cool. You guys know that this is written in an acrostic. The poem is an acrostic, which is a typical like bananagrams game or Scrabble crossword puzzle type, you know, where you have uh, the alphabet coming down vertically, and each stanza, the first letter, of the first line of the stanza would correspond, right? So we'll say, actually, sorry, I'm going backwards. So it'd be like, A, apples are 
yucky. B, bananas are yucky. C, carrots are yucky. D, don't make me eat them, right? That would be an acrostic for it, right? It's just an example. So the book of Lamentation is written in the same way as an acrostic. Now, you ask, what's the significance for us of understanding that? Why would you share that with me? The reason I'm sharing that is because it demonstrates for, for us that this book and this portion of scripture is not an emotional, uncalculated gush of grief. It's not some unthought, on the tip of the tongue, just blog post or, or Facebook rant or like a Taylor Swift song or something. This is a highly thought out, reflective response to trauma. All the emotion is there. It's, it's easy to see in this book. All the emotion is there. But it wasn't written simply to be just expressive. It wasn't written just for Jeremiah to express himself. And it wasn't written just for Jeremiah to record a fact of history. Actually, what the structure shares with us is that it was written to be instructive, memorized, a mnemonic device actually for these Hebrew people so that they'd remember it. And by using the acrostic, this acrostic, the author is basically demonstrating that this is a complete and total expression of his grief, AKA everything from A to Z, or in the Hebrew letters, has been covered. It's, it's all been talked about on this topic. So, Jeremiah, our author, is trying to instruct Israel through the, through the situation on hand, what's happening, how they can experience grief, as well as in the future, so that we might be able to sift through our emotions, not just grief, but anger, and hurt, and fear, and bitterness, and unforgiveness in a God-honoring way, in the way that God had intended. So keep these things in mind, and look out for Jeremiah's instruction and example as we study some of these verses, which leads us into my first point. In verse 16 and 17, point one, he identifies his thoughts. Otherwise said, this is what I feel. This is how I feel. He identifies his thoughts. Verse 16 says this. He, made, he has made my teeth grind on gravel and made me cower in ashes. My soul, in verse 17, is bereft or robbed of peace. I have forgotten what happiness is. This is the sixth stanza in the third chapter. And basically it's a summary of the previous five stanzas in which Jeremiah is saying, I feel as if God has trampled me into the ashes and made me chew on rocks, on gravel. That's the type of pain and rejection that I feel right now. It's a physical picture for us. You can see it in your, in your mind. You can imagine the type of sorrow that Jeremiah has. That he feels like God has shoved him into the ground to make him sit in the ashes and chew on these rocks. And he says in verse 17, my soul has been rejected by peace. That's a proper way to understand it. Peace has rejected me. Peace has been completely stripped away from him, robbed of it. No peace. And he says, and he adds to it, that his misery is so great, he's forgotten what happiness is. He has forgotten that which is good. He has no memory of things enjoyable or good. And I think maybe even here this morning, maybe there's somebody who is experiencing the same thing where it's hard to sleep at night. It just, it feels like even the things that I used to find great pleasure in, because of this feelings that I have, whether it's bitterness or sorrow, anxiety, it, the things I used to love, I feel like have been stripped away. A part of me, I, I don't even remember, I can't even remember right now what is enjoyable. And so it's understandable in regards to what's happening, why Jeremiah feels this way. And then in verse 18, this is what he does. He identifies his feelings and he speaks them out. He actually says them audibly. So I say, verse 18, my endurance has perished so has my hope from the Lord, AKA, I'm giving up. Like, I don't feel the will to live any longer. My endurance, my strength to carry on, it's dried up. I just, 
I just don't feel the strength to live. And so he speaks this out. He, he identifies his feelings as painful as they might be, as painful as they might be, he acknowledges them. And he says even that my hope from the Lord, which is interesting, remember that because it changes at the end of the chapter. He says, my hope from the Lord, I have none. I have none. In verse 20, excuse me, verse 19. He cries out for the Lord to be attentive to his affliction. He says, remember, the, the Lord's name is not there, but it's implied. It says, remember, Lord, my affliction and my wanderings, the wormwood and the gall, which is speaking of the bitterness that has seemed to consume him. He's saying, Lord, the, the, the word there, remember, actually, in the Hebrew, it's not, it's not saying, Lord, can you recall this to mind? He's saying, Lord, look at me. Like, do you see me? I'm trying to draw attention. It seems that you don't know the affliction and the wanderings that are going on in my life. And sometimes that's how we feel too, as if, God, do you even know what's happening right now? Do you know, are you aware of the situation, the bitterness, the affliction, the wanderings that I have? He's calling, actually, all these words are really, really strong ties back to the Exodus. He's calling for the Lord of Exodus, the God who existed in Exodus, to draw him out of exile. And then he says in verse 20, my soul continually remembers it, the affliction and the bitterness, the wandering, the exile, and is bowed down within me. In the Hebrew, he actually uses the word for remember, zakar, zakar, zakar. He uses it twice because he's trying to emphasize what that means for us. The author is trying to emphasize that this is a continual remembrance. It's like all that seems to be set on his mind is this, that he can't shake it, no matter what he does. He goes to sleep, this is on his mind. He wakes up, this is on his mind, right? He can't seem to shake it. His soul continually remembers it, just continually identifies it, and he's asking for the Lord. Lord, do you see me? Remember me, Lord. So, Jeremiah, he doesn't deny these feelings, though. He doesn't ignore these feelings. He simply identifies them, confesses them. He says, this is how I'm feeling. That's point one. And this might seem obvious. Duke, duh. You know, I know how to do that. Everybody does that. But in reality, because feelings often, memories, they often come with pain, our world tends to try and avoid them. So instead of identifying these pains, and addressing them and encountering them, handling in a godly way. People drink them away. They turn to the bottle, right? So that the memories and the thoughts, at least temporarily, would be forgotten. They turn to the pills and to the joints and to drugs. So that the pain they feel, these things that are overcome, at least temporarily, they go away. Some people, I think this might be the most common one, is we turn to distraction. I don't want to encounter my feelings right now, so what I'm going to do is stay so busy, occupy myself in so many places so that I don't have time to think about it. And if I do that, then I can avoid how I feel. Jeremiah understands that memories and thoughts and feelings are sometimes associated with things that can be tough for us. It doesn't let him stop him, though. He identifies his feelings. And it seems even at this point that the only thing his memory does is aid his misery. If something incredible and transforming happens. Incredible in verse 21. Which brings up point two. He identifies the truth. This is what I remember. Take a look at verse 21. But, but, Although I'm feeling afflicted and exiled, bitter, sad, rejected, hopeless, this I call to mind. This I call to mind. And this is the step that the world most often misses. Even if able to identify its feelings, I'm pissed, I'm hurt, I'm sad. This is the step that the world most often forgets about. It's identifying the truth. 
And as Jeremiah begins to call this to mind, the truth to mind, memory begins to function in its proper place. See, memory is actually a gift from God. It was always intended, he gave it to us so that we'd worship him in sincerity and worship him with all. And we'd, we'd think back and see back on all the good things that God has done and we'd, we'd praise him for it, right? It gives us the ability, memory, not just to recall facts, like arbitrary facts, but also feelings. So as we think back to the goodness of God, we, we would our entire emotion worship him and say how good he is, right? These feelings can be so deep that sometimes you're by yourself and you'll laugh, yeah? You're by yourself in the room and you're thinking back to a funny story or your mom did this or your brother did this and you laugh like out loud. Sometimes it's so deep, these feelings, that we can cry. Tears can come from our face years after something has happened. And sometimes memory brings feelings so deep that it drives people to lifelong pursuits of vindication or revenge or proving somebody wrong. This, they, this happened, they, they hurt me, they didn't believe in me. I'm gonna spend my, my whole life remembering that and proving them wrong. That's a memory. So this is under the control of the flesh, under the control of the flesh, memory can, can actually suffocate us. It can starve us out with bitterness and fear, unforgiveness, a loss of identity, insecurities, it, it can bring these things up. But under the will of the Spirit. Charles Spurgeon, Charles Spurgeon refers to it actually as the handmaiden of hope. I have a quote here. And in regards to memory, this is what he says. We lay it down then as a general principle that if we would exercise our memories a little more, we might in our very deepest and darkest distress strike a match which would instantaneously kindle the lamp of comfort. There is no need for God to create a new thing. Although I might add, he does and he can. There is no need for God to create a new thing in order to restore believers to joy if they would prayerfully rake the ashes of the past. They would find light for the present, and if they would turn to the book of truth and to the throne of grace, their candle would soon shine as before. And so what Charles Spurgeon here is saying that the memory for us is a gift to God, is a gift, excuse me, from God, meant to aid us in our worship. But under its wrong use, wrongly intended use, or, the, or the, under the will of the flesh, it distorts and twists things. Let's look back at verse 21. He says this, in, in reference to the word mind there, he says, but this I call a mind, right? We're talking about memory. He refers not just here at this point, uh, he, he's not just referring to his brain, some intellectual thought. He's actually referring in this word mind to the seat of his thought and his volition. It's the, it's the active intention of recalling knowledge to the area of his inner disposition, where the will is coming from. He's not saying, I just want to, like know about it, he's saying, I want to believe this. I'm trying to recall this into, into my mind so that it for me is the truth, is something I believe. So at the moment of his deepest despair and his bitter affliction, he begins to ingrain in his mind something that brings hope. Remember, he was hopeless, right? Something that brings hope. He says, therefore I have hope. He's like, what did you remember that brought you hope just there? Because you were the dude like two verses ago saying, I have no hope, I don't want to live, right? What is it? What is this? What is it he remembers? He remembers the Lord. He remembers the Lord. And he identifies the truth of the Lord. Verse 3, I mean, excuse me, verses 22 to 23 say this. The steadfast love of God, excuse me, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercy never comes to an end. They are new every morning, and great is your faithfulness. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. The steadfast love, hesed in the Hebrew, right, refers to this covenant love, a faithful love, a loyal love, a love that never departs. And he says, this type of love, the only love that God gives, it never ends. 
And he adds to that and he reflects and he's recalling to his mind the God of Exodus who's brought them through all these other things. And he says, his mercy, rahamim, it's, a, it's referring to a, a parental type compassion, actually the motherly compassion for their child where the mercy is not just, I'm not gonna give you what you deserve. It's a deep felt compassion. Like I understand what you're going through. He says his mercies, they never fail. And like an endless spring of fresh water, cold, fresh water for the parched soul, he says that his love and his mercy are new for us every day. Every day they are. It's accessible to us and available to us. It's up to us to dip in and take a drink from it. But his mercies and his love are there. Although it might not seem like it, the truth is that they are. The next line he says, great is your faithfulness. Great is your faithfulness? Faithfulness. It doesn't seem like faithfulness, what's going on, really, right? As you survey the situation, it doesn't seem like faithfulness. It was. It was. See, God had promised. God promised Israel. If they did not turn from their false idols, if they continued to walk in evil ways and make alliances, see at this time they were making alliances with these wicked nations. They had, they had fear on the east and on the west and on the south that, that they were going to get conquered. So they started making alliances with wicked nations. God says, stop doing that. You're turning to idols. They're bringing all this idolatry into your life. Trust in me. I can be your defender. I can defend you. And Israel says, I don't know, God. Like, you know how spooky those guys are. And they, they keep making these alliances. He says, if you don't turn from your ways, if you don't turn and repent and trust in me, there will be destruction. He promises them. And he promised also, he said, if, I promise, if you would turn and if you would trust in me, I will deliver you from these things. As you read the book of Jeremiah and Isaiah and, and even through 2 Kings, you, you see th these conversations going on. But Israel, they didn't. They didn't turn. They didn't trust in God. They trusted in themselves to defend themselves. They, they didn't believe in what he had said. And so God was faithful to do what he promised. He let them be destroyed. Now see, the faithfulness that Jeremiah is talking about here also includes God's promise to him in Jeremiah 31, 31. You guys might remember that. And this promise, in this promise, he says, I will make a new covenant. The old covenant, done. I'm gonna make a new covenant with my people where I write the law on their hearts and no longer do they desire just to live in rebellion the law will actually be imposed and I will be their God and they will be my people. He promises this to Jeremiah, a new covenant. And although Jeremiah this time, these things might not be happening at this point, Jeremiah is hoping and, and he says, I know my God is faithful and he promised that he would ultimately restore and redeem us. And so although things look crazy, I don't trust what I see, I trust the Lord. It's the character of God that forms the basis of Jeremiah's hope. And so after looking at his problems now, through the lens of God, you know, Pastor Waxer always uses that one, right? Now that he sees his problems through the lens of God and not the other way around, he does point three, which is he identifies the proper response or this is what I will do. I will commit myself to in this way, in this action. Take a look at verse 24. You can almost feel Jeremiah's heart start to beat again. Life come back to him. The burdens being dropped off, right? The depression being lifted. As he says, the Lord is my portion. The Lord is my portion. So that's a metaphor. He's drawing back from um, Joshua 19 where, where special where land was inherited and he's dividing it, right? All these different portions of land are being given to the different tribes of Israel at this point. You guys remember Levi. Levi didn't receive an inheritance of land. 
And Deuteronomy 10, 9 comments on that actually. They didn't receive the land, they were the one, right? They, they were uh, chosen to special service with the Lord. They actually were the priests that stood in the temple, carried the ark, right? They had the closeness. So Deuteronomy 10, 9 says this, at that time the Lord set apart the tribe of Levi to carry the ark of the covenant of the Lord, to stand before the Lord, to serve him and to bless his name until this day. Therefore, Levi does not have a portion or inheritance with his brothers in reference to the land. The Lord is his portion, just as the Lord your God spoke to him. And so as Jeremiah calls out and says, the Lord is my portion, in essence, what he's saying is, although the lands might not be ours, although the lands might have been conquered and destroyed, I have the better part, the Lord is my portion. That's all my soul needs. And in response to that, in response to the pain, as he's dwelling on the truth, this is what he does. He just simply goes deep into his relationship with God, right? He identifies his feelings. This is how I feel. He identifies the truth. And then he goes deep into his relationship with God. He just drives in those points. He's re reminding his heart as he speaks them out. The Lord is my portion. Now, Jeremiah's response after that, point three, this is what I'll do. This is what he was to do. Therefore, I will hope in him. I won't just have a hopeful attitude. That's not what he's saying. Therefore, I will actively put my trust in the Lord. Verses 40 and 41 later in this chapter actually detail some other things that Jeremiah, thinking rightly now, identifies. This is what I need to do. And, and he says that, <clears throat> We need to test and examine in his specific situation, in his specific time, this is what they needed to do. This was the proper response. To test and examine their ways, to see the wickedness that was there, to see the rebellion and the idolatry, the ways that they walked away from the Lord and made these handshake agreements. They had to examine their ways and return to the Lord. So the proper response for them, first thing was repenting. The second thing in verse 41 for, for Jeremiah and Israel at this time, the proper thing for them to do was to lift up their hands and their hearts to God in heaven and to praise him, right? The proper thing, even in this situation, was to praise God. Thank you, God. The fact that I'm even still breathing is an, is an evidence of your mercy. So Jeremiah, he didn't stop grieving, if you notice in the text. If you read through the rest of chapter three or even through the rest of the book, Jeremiah's grief doesn't stop. And it shouldn't have, actually. It, the grief in itself wasn't wrong. His grief without hope was wrong. First Thessalonians 4.13 tells us that people in this world will grieve, and, and we're going to grieve too, especially at the loss of life. But we're different in the way that we grieve because we grieve with hope. The resurrection of Christ secures that for us. And so though we grieve, he says, not without hope. That's 1 Thessalonians 4.13. The basis for this renewed hope is God's great love, his infinite mercy and compassion and his great love. So I wanna give an example kind of, of what this looks like, how the world handles things and how Jeremiah and the Bible has instructed for us to handle the motions. So we'll just take a scenario. Maybe, you, maybe your job is in question, okay? Your job security is in question. I'm not sure. I got two more weeks on the job. I, I don't know if I'm gonna have a job next month, right? I don't know if I'm gonna get this job, maybe even. You're thinking the job is in question. Well, some people don't identify the feelings, right? They just push them away. They turn to the bottle. They turn to the pills. They, they distract themselves. Some people, even if they do identif identify their feelings, feel like, Guilt and shame, I feel like a failure. Like, I'm letting all these people down. There's people who count on me, I feel shameful. Maybe I feel anger against my management. Man, they don't recognize me. They don't, I work so hard and I never try and bring attention to myself. Why don't they ever recognize me? Maybe there's fear 
and, and worry or anxiety being brought in. How am I going to pay for my kids to go to the outside? How am I going to pay for rent? How am I going to pay these bills? That, don't you, there's so much debt already. The, the fear begins to creep on. The anxiety maybe and the depression where you say, it's out of my control. I'm going to lose my job. I know it. Then what's going to happen? I got nothing. And you, you begin to say, I'm over. I'm done. The situation has consumed me. So this is what the road does. I'm going to give up. Quit. Stop trying. What's the use? Out of my control. I'm going to be retaliatory, maybe. Towards my management. Oh, they're going to know how they made me feel, right? Or I'm going to make them feel so guilty. Yeah, I'm going to get back at those people. Or maybe I'm going to work so hard with this edge, this nervousness edge, harsh, because everything's on me on my performance to uphold this job for me, right? Or maybe I'm just going to turn to the pill or to the bottle. And Jeremiah says, you forgot about the truth. And so how we're supposed to handle it is like this. Maybe our job security is in question. You don't know if you're going to get the job. You don't know where you're going to stay. You don't know some detail. I do feel guilt and shame. Man, I do feel like a failure. Maybe part of this is, is on me. I don't know. I just feel guilty, though, and shameful. I do feel anger. I feel anger against my management. I do work so hard. Why? And they don't recognize me, right? They're giving promotions to everybody that came here after me. I do feel this anger. I feel belittled, fearful, and worried. I, I am worried and fearful. I don't know how we're going to pay for the bills. It is important that my kids go to school and college. I don't know how we're going to do these things. Maybe anxious even. I feel like this is out of my control. It's not up to me. And then you say, this is what I call to mind. I don't know ultimately what will happen, but God does. And God, he loves me. He's not unaware of my situation. God, I know you see me. Your omniscience, your omnipotence, you see, you haven't forgotten my situation, God. You know exactly what I'm going through right now. You know what's in my heart, the, the, the feelings I have, the situation at hand. And I know, this is what I'm going to call to mind, that if God didn't spare his son, but gave him up for me, what would he withhold? Nothing. I know, God, that you haven't forgotten. I know that you're fully aware. And I know that ultimately you desire what is eternally best for me and my family. You love us both. I can trust in you. So this is what I'm going to do. Point three, right? I'm going to work hard. I'm going to be proactive about these job searches and stuff, but I'm going to work hard and faithfully, but as unto the Lord. Not to prove people wrong, not to push it in their face. I'm just going to work hard as unto the Lord with a full piece of me. And I trust in God in this situation. And I'm going to actively set my hope in him. I'm going to hope in him. Now as we come to a close, I want to fast forward 600 years from this point where Jeremiah is writing, where we find another prophet, actually. He's also on the Mount of Olives, and he's mourning. He's on the Mount of Olives mourning. It's not the weeping prophet, Jeremiah, but Isaiah 53 calls him a man of sorrows acquainted with grief. It's the Lamb of God that was here to take away the sins of the world. And he sits there from the mount looking on destruction and seeing the separation that has occurred, seeing the pains, and he mourns. And he reflects even upon the impending destruction of the temple, just like before. But see, John tells us that this temple to be destroyed was his body. And his body was beaten and his blood was shed to secure the new covenant for all those who would believe. And to forever 
establish the, Lord of, the Lord's love never ceases and his compassion never fails. So that we would see and remember, us 2,000 years later, that we would see and remember, great is his faithfulness. And we've seen it on the cross. This is the gospel for us. This is the gospel that God sent his son for sinners of whom I'm the foremost to save us so that we might not be eternally separated but reconciled unto him. And this evening, if you have not recognized Jesus as your Lord and Savior of your life, but you feel maybe God spoke to your heart, he opened up some, he spoke something to you to, to respond to this gospel. You see his love, you see the love of Christ. Believe it. Trust it. Hold on to it. Believe in him, our God of mercy. And listen, I'm going to be off on the side, probably over there. And there will be some people in just a minute off to the sides too. And if that's you, I encourage you, please, come and talk to us. There will be people here. I'll, I'll be here. And I'd love to both pray for you and to pray with you to tell you what it means to be saved by grace alone in the name of Christ through faith in Christ. And Christian, this morning, see if the flesh and the emotions, all the feelings, maybe there's a situation in your life. I, I'm not sure what's going on, but I know God is keenly aware of what's going on. You have this situation. You feel, I've been handling things in this situation or over this month or however long of a time. I've been handling it. Emotion has been the master over me lately. I encourage you, as the worship team plays and as we have the, the time of communion, to ask God to reveal to you the truth that you need to hear, to, to give you a fresh revelation. Lord, what is, it, what is the truth that you need for me to be reminded of that I have to set and believe in my mind so that I would act righteously in the middle of these things? And I'm just gonna be encourage you to do that. Ask him to reveal that to you and to be renewed, to be renewed and transformed as these things are brought to mind. So family, while it's true that God has a plan that we don't yet see, that's true. That text is timely. It must be remembered that it was the plan of God that we've already seen that allows us to trust and to hope in him for our future. Let's pray. Thank you for your love, Lord, for sending Christ for us. You call us friends now. That's how you identify us. Thank you for your unfailing love and compassion in our life, Lord. Thank you for being keenly aware of all the situations that we're going through. Help our hearts, Lord, this morning to trust in you. And bring to mind, Lord, fresh revelations, new things, new, things that, that we need to hear this morning so that we would ultimately be delivered from emotional bondage and be given over to you, Lord, to hope in you. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Hey, thank you for spending your time with us today at One Love Ministries and being a part of our program. But this invitation that you heard today through the Word of God is directly to you. And I want you to know if you have not yet made a profession of faith, meaning ask Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior, that invitation is available to you right now change, transformation, all the glorious things that God wants to do are available to you, but you got to ask. You must personally invite Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior. So if God has been speaking to you during this message, your heart's been beating, your hands been cutting kind of sweaty, you've been wrestling with things, guess what? That's the Lord knocking on your heart. And I want to lead you right now in a prayer that can allow you to invite Jesus Christ to become your Lord and Savior and open the door for eternity for you and Him to be together. I want you to pray with me right now. It's not a magic prayer, but an honest heart that will invite the Lord into your life. Join me right now. Dear Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for my sin. I ask you to forgive me and to become my Lord and Savior. Today, Jesus, I believe that you are God and that you saved me and my faith will be put in you. Please give me your Holy Spirit to come in and upon me, that I might learn how to live as a child of God. 
Thank you, Jesus, for your love. And today, I come home. In your name I pray. Amen. If you prayed that prayer with us, we are excited. The Bible says the angels in heaven are rejoicing and we want to join them too. So would you call this number right here on the bottom of the screen and let us know. We want to help you find a church that's in your area. Get plugged in, get fellowship, get disciple as the Bible says. Because we want to grow in God's grace together. God bless you. He loves you. We're excited. If you would like to receive a copy of today's message, please write down the sermon number on your screen and give us a call at 955-9335. For service times and locations, check us out on the web at onelove.org. Mahalo for watching.